The story begins by showing a young mathematician who is giving autographs to his female fans. He had claimed to the world that he had proven Goldbach's conjecture theory, which no one had been able to prove for 250 years, and as a result, his popularity had suddenly skyrocketed. Within 10 days, he has to demonstrate this theory to the media. Suddenly, his friend shouts from the window, informing him that someone has broken into his house and destroyed all his demonstrations and his laptop. He quickly rushes home, where his friend asks him what he is going to do now. The mathematician assures that he can rework on it, but it will take him several months. Then the scene shifts to an elderly professor who is playing chess with a psychiatrist, who is also his friend. The professor tells the doctor that a few days ago, he was contemplating suicide, but then he received a letter in the mail that made him abandon the plan. This letter was sent by an anonymous man named Fermat. In the letter, Fermat has given a challenging number puzzle and mentioned that if the professor could solve it and send it back by mail, he will have the opportunity to attend a gathering this weekend, where he will meet other genius mathematicians and engineers like himself. The doctor had already sent the solved puzzle back to Fermat. Next we see an engineer who has also received a similar puzzle letter but has been struggling to solve it for the past 10 days. He is sitting in a library attempting to crack the puzzle. Suddenly, the librarian approaches him and assures him that if he wishes, he can stay here overnight, but he must arrange the books in alphabetical order before leaving. Upon hearing this, an idea clicks in his mind, and he arranges the numbers in the puzzle in alphabetical order, successfully solving it, and mails it to Format. Following that, they receive another letter from Format, stating that only four people have managed to solve the puzzle. All the participants who solve the puzzle are invited to the gathering, where they will be presented with the greatest enigma of all time. But there are some conditions they need to follow, the first condition is that no one should bring their cell phones to the gathering. The second condition is that no one should reveal their true identities, thus Format has assigned everyone a temporary name. The engineer is given the name Pascal, and he's the first to arrive at the location Format mentioned. After stepping out from his car, he becomes quite confused because the place appears completely deserted with no buildings or houses around. Just then, another participant, a girl named Oliva arrives. Pascal tries to impress her by telling her that he's an inventor and even shows his unique popcorn machine that he invented. However, Oliva doesn't seem particularly impressed. On the other hand, we see the professor who is assigned the name Hilbert. His car breaks down on the way to the gathering, and he unsuccessfully tries to fix it. Then he hitchhikes with a man who turns out to be none other than the young mathematician who claims to have proven Goldbach's conjecture and is also heading to the same gathering. He is given the name Galois for the event. Both Hilbert and Galois arrive at the same deserted location. Everyone is clueless about why they have been called here, and there is no sign of the host format. Hilbert having attended such gatherings before, reassures everyone that geniuses always do things in a peculiar way and that someone will come to pick them up in a luxurious car shortly. Just then, Galois spots a car's headlights blinking on the other side of the river. They all start waving their hands, and Galois climbs on a abandoned boat to signal them. However Hilbert notices that the boat has Pythagoras written on it, and he realizes that this is their luxurious car. They all hop onto the boat, cross the river, and by the time they reach the shore, it's already dark. They check the car but find no one inside. Inside the car, they discover a PDA phone that was connected to the car's lights, causing them to blink when it was time. The car's GPS has a location preset, and they follow the GPS to that location. Upon arrival, they are shocked to find nothing but an abandoned factory. However with some courage, they enter the factory which is pitch black, and it doesn't seem like there's any gathering here. Nevertheless, as they move forward for some time, they finally discover a fully furnished perfect room with lights, a running fan, food, plenty of books, and even a piano but the host format is still missing. Everyone starts waiting for format, having no damn idea when he will arrive. Oliva begins playing the piano to pass the time, and that's when Galois reveals that he had tried to find out more about format, and that the person who invited them here is not actually named format. He explains that about a month ago, after cracking the number puzzle, he attempted to discover the owner of P.O. Box 325. Initially, they refused to reveal any information, but when he claimed to be from the president's office and that it pertained to national security, they disclosed format's real name. When Hilbert asks for the name, Galois finds it difficult to remember, and everyone makes fun of him, saying that he ain't no shit and is just wasting time. He also mentions that there is no information available about Format on internet. As they discuss this, Format finally enters through the door, apologizing for being late. He invites everyone to the dinner table. While having dinner, they all engage in a lively conversation about various mathematical and scientific hypotheses. Right after dinner, Format receives a phone call, and it strikes everyone as odd because Format had initially discouraged anyone from bringing phones and yet he brought one himself. The conversation on the phone seems strange to everyone, and Format becomes visibly tense. He informs the group that he received a call from the doctor, and they have some news about his daughter who is currently in coma. They have urgently summoned him to the hospital. Due to pesky network issues, Format couldn't hear the full details about his daughter's condition. 
He apologizes to the group and assures them that he will return from the hospital in an hour before rushing out. Pascal notices that Format has forgotten his coat and chases after him to return it, but unfortunately he has already left. Suddenly a wallet slips from Format's jacket, and Pascal checks it. Inside he finds a picture of a young girl, which leaves him completely dumbfounded. He returns to the room in a tense state, where Galois also checks Format's purse, finding his ID inside, which reveals that the man's name is not Format but Roman. However, they speculate that just as Roman had given them temporary names, he might have given himself the name Format. This realization brings some relief to their confusion. Suddenly the PDA rings, and Oliva checks on it. There's an Enigma puzzle with a timer to solve it within one minute. The puzzle is about a shopkeeper who has three boxes, one with mint-flavored candies, one with chocolate-flavored candies, and one with a mix of both. The labels on all three boxes are incorrect. The question is, how many candies must the shopkeeper take out from each box to correctly identify the contents of all three boxes? Galois immediately says that they simply take one candy from each box to figure out the content of all the boxes. However, Hilbert corrects him, pointing out that the mixed box contains candies of both flavors, so picking one candy from each won't distinguish it. He believes it's a probability problem. As they are discussing it, one minute passes. Just as the time is up, Pascal, who had been standing and drinking alone near a bookshelf, feels something strange. He approaches the others and tells them that it's not a probability problem, the answer is hidden within the question itself. He explains that every box has the wrong label. For example, the label on the third box says mix, but if they take out one candy and it turns out to be mint, it's clear that it's not a mixed box but a mint candy box because the question states that every box is wrongly labeled. Then, if they open the mint labeled box, it will obviously contain chocolate candy, because if it contains mint, then it means that it's a mixed box as they already found mint. But then they are left only with the chocolate labeled box, which contains chocolate. This can't be right because the question says that every box is wrongly labeled. Therefore, the mint labeled box contains chocolate, and nothing else can be possible, and the chocolate labeled box must contain the mixture, and nothing else can be possible. Impressed by Pascal's intelligence, they input the answer on the PDA, which turns out to be correct. However Pascal in a tense state, says that the room is shrinking, and he felt it as soon as the PDA's one minute timer was over. Everyone is shocked by Pascal's words, and Galois tries to open the door, but it's locked. That's when another enigma appears on the PDA, containing binary numbers. Galois says he can solve it and starts arranging puzzles from a Chinese block game in the room, replacing one with white and zero with black. At that moment, Hilbert stumbles upon an invoice document in the room, revealing that Roman had purchased four hydraulic presses in the last two months. Hilbert mentions that he has been to many strange and mysterious gatherings where mind-boggling riddles are given, and clues are left in the room to solve them. However, Pascal believes that this is not a game, Roman intends to commit a crime. He explains that Roman has set up a hydraulic press on each wall, connected to the PDA device, and each riddle that appears on the PDA has a time assigned to it. If they delay in providing an answer, the room will start shrinking. Just as Galois is working on the riddle, the timer goes off, and the room begins to shrink. Everyone is terrified, and Pascal calculates that each press moves forward at a speed of 10 centimeters per minute, which means that in an hour, the room will be the size of an elevator, and then it will crush them. They all begin placing a piano and various objects against the walls in an attempt to stop it. Pascal makes fun of them, saying that a hydraulic press can turn a car into a cube of scrap, and yet they believe a piano can stop it. Everyone silences Pascal, pointing out that at least they are doing something instead of just standing around and drinking. However the piano crumbles under the pressure of wall, making them realize they can't stop the hydraulic press, and Galois returns to solving the riddle. Hilbert suggests that if they solve each riddle on time the walls won't advance, but Pascal argues that we are humans not machines, and after a while we will get tired and the walls will crush us. Oliva asks what could be Roman's ultimate goal is and why he wants to kill them. That's when Pascal reveals a shocking truth and says that Roman wants revenge from him. He reveals that a few years ago, he was driving to an important business meeting when he accidentally hit a girl who was crossing the road without any traffic lights. He called an ambulance, but he left the scene before it arrived because he was running late. The next day, he went to the police station to apologize to the girl's family, but the police didn't let him meet them. Later, he found out that the girl had fallen into coma. Today when he saw the photo in Roman's purse, he realized she is the same girl, and now Roman wants to take revenge on him for his daughter's condition. Just then, Galois successfully completes the puzzle, which happens to resemble a face. He quickly types face as the answer on the PDA, only to be met with the disheartening buzz of rejection. Oliva looks at the puzzle game and corrects him that it's not a face but a skull. Galois types the answer again and it turns out be correct this time and the room stops shrinking. Galois then asks Pascal, why did Roman trap them if his only intention is to take revenge on Pascal? Pascal explains that Roman's true intention is to kill only him, the three of them are just circumstantial victims in this room. As they are discussing, another enigma appears on the PDA, and Hilbert starts reading it. 
Imagine there is a room with one light bulb, and three switches outside. Only one of these switches controls the light bulb inside the room. The catch is that you can't see the bulb from where you are standing, and you can only turn on one switch before entering the room. And once you enter the room, you can't go back to change the switches. Your task is to determine which of the three switches controls the light. Everyone begins to think hard to solve this riddle, but Pascal is distracted and starts talking about something else. He questions why Roman sent them the enigma in the letter if his intention was to have them killed here. If they couldn't solve it, they wouldn't have received an invitation, and they would have been safe at home, and Roman's plan would have failed. Hilbert asks Pascal if anyone had helped or given him a clue to solve the enigma. Pascal suddenly remembers that the librarian had asked him to arrange the books in alphabetical order, which had given him the idea to solve the enigma. Then we are shown that the librarian is taking money from a man, meaning someone had deliberately sent her to Pascal to provide him with a clue for solving the enigma. Meanwhile, the timer runs out and the room starts shrinking again. As the room shrinks, the lights mounted on the walls begin to shatter. Everyone rushes to bring the remaining lights to the center of the room to prevent total darkness. However in the process, Hilbert's hand gets burned by a light. Seeing this, Oliva's mind clicks with the solution. She explains that they will turn on the first switch and leave it on for a while, then turn it off and turn on the second switch and enter the room. Now there are two possibilities. If the light bulb is on when they enter the room, that means the second switch is the correct one, but if it's off, they have two switches left. In this case, they will feel the light bulb. If it's warm to the touch, that means the first switch is the correct one because they left it on briefly before turning it off. But if the light bulb is cool, it means the third switch is the correct one, as they never turned it on. Oliva enters this answer into the PDA and it turns out to be correct. Pascal then come across a book on the bookshelf and asks Oliva her age. She reveals herself as 26 years old. Pascal tells her about Oliva Sabuco, a medical philosopher who also died at the age of 26, possibly explaining why Roman gave her the name Oliva. Next Pascal asks Galois his age, to which he replies 20. Pascal checks and informs that the mathematician Evariste Galois died at the age of 20. Then he checks his own information and says he is 39 years old, and when mathematician Blaise Pascal died, he was also 39. Galois hastily snatches the book from Pascal and checks for Format's information. He finds that Pierre de Format died at the age of 57, and Roman's age is also 57 on his ID. Seeing this Galois loses his mind, believing Roman to be a deranged psycho. He breaks the mirror on the wall, thinking that Roman might be watching them with a camera hidden behind the mirror, but finds nothing there. Just then one more enigma rings the PDA and Oliva starts solving it with the help of Sandbox Timer. The men start brainstorming an escape plan from the room. Hilbert wonders if anything can stop a press in the end. Pascal says that a hydraulic press can only be stopped by another press, and if they can set up the two presses against the other two, the forces will neutralize and the presses will stop. Following this, they lay the bookshelves horizontally on the ground and start filling the gaps with books and alcohol bottles to create pressure against the wall, eventually neutralizing it. Just as Olivia solves the sandbox enigma, another enigma simultaneously appears on the PDA. Olivia reads out the enigma, and Galois immediately answers it. However, he instructs Olivia not to send the answer just yet, as the next question will arrive soon since the timer for this question hasn't ended. Oliva types the answer on the PDA but places it onto the table without sending it. She then starts helping her companions to fill the gaps in the bookshelf to resist the pressure from the presses. However in the midst of the chaos, Oliva forgets to send the answer on the PDA, and the room starts shrinking again, causing their makeshift structure to fall apart. Simultaneously, the PDA gets lost in the chaos, and the room continues to shrink. Everyone starts searching for the PDA, and during this search, Oliva stumbles upon an invitation letter, similar to the one they received from Format. In the letter, it is written that Roman has been assigned the name Format, leading them to realize that Roman is not the real villain here. Someone else had summoned Roman with a similar letter and assigned him a different task, instructing him to bring a cell phone along. This explains why Roman had his phone with him. Furthermore, the revelation about Pascal finding Roman's code and discovering his involvement in the accident might just be a coincidence, as Pascal had never met the girl's parents before today. Hilbert finds the PDA and sends the answer, causing the hydraulic pressure to stop. Now, they are left wondering who is behind all of this if it's not Roman, and why is he doing this? On the other side, Roman arrives at the hospital and inquires about his daughter. However, the nurses inform him that they did not make any calls, and his daughter is still in coma. They suggest that someone might have pranked him. Roman bewildered and frustrated, questions who could play such a cruel joke after he drove 60 kilometers, leaving an important meeting behind. The nurse advises him not to stress and recommends going home to take rest. Roman leaves the hospital with his mind in turmoil. On the other side, the four of them continue to wonder who wants to kill them and why. Oliva asks Galois who destroyed the proof of Goldbach's conjecture by breaking into his home. Galois explains that it was a jealous neighborhood kid. 
Oliva is puzzled, wondering how it's possible for a child to break into a highly secure home and destroy a complete demonstration without Galois noticing even a hint of it. Hilbert questions Oliva about how she knows such detailed information about Galois' house. Oliva, although hesitantly, reveals a shocking truth. She and Galois used to be in a relationship for two years, but they broke up later. Pascal scolds them for keeping this information secret, emphasizing that if they continue to hide things from each other, they won't find a clue to a way out of the room. Then another enigma pops up on the PDA. The question presents a situation where a man is trapped in a room with two doors, one leading to freedom and the other to the trap. There are guards at both doors, with the guard at the freedom door always tells the truth, and the guard at the trap door always lies. However, the man doesn't know which guard tells the truth and which one lies. The man can ask only one guard a single question and must then choose a door. The four of them start thinking about the solution by recreating the scenario provided in the enigma. After a while, Pascal figures out the answer. He suggests that they should approach the guard at door A and ask, which door will the other guard say leads to freedom? If the first guard is the freedom guard who tells the truth, he will indicate that the second guard, who always lies, will point to door B as the freedom door. However, if the guard at door A is the trap door guard, he will falsely claim that the second guard will identify door A as the freedom door. In either case, they should choose the opposite door from the one the guard suggests. Pascal enters this answer into the PDA, and it turns out to be correct. Pascal then asks Oliva and Galois why they ultimately broke up. Oliva explains that when they were in a relationship, she was exceptionally skilled at chess, and no one could beat her. However one day she downloaded chess app on her phone and came across an opponent who kept on defeating her, no matter how hard she tried. They started playing chess together every day, and she never won against him even once. This led her to develop a crush on him. One day, he invited her to play chess face to face on his yacht, which was in the middle of the ocean and hosting a wild party with illegal activities and drugs. She enjoyed herself immensely and began going there frequently, not realizing how Galois might react if she tell him the truth, so she decided to broke up with him. Pascal suggests that this might be the same chess guy who is doing all this. But Oliva drops a bombshell by revealing that he can't be the one because he is currently present in the room. This shocks Pascal and Galois and they turn to Hilbert, who was solving the enigma. In his fury, Galois shoves the PDA from Hilbert's hands and starts crying. Pascal screams at Galois for shoving the PDA as they will die without it. The room continues to shrink slowly, and in his distress, Galois says that he no longer cares if he dies. This leads Pascal to suspect that Galois might be behind the whole plan since he seems to want to die but also wants to take revenge on Hilbert and Oliva and watch them die with him. He reminds them that after the dinner, Roman received a phone call that made him leave the gathering. Whoever made the call knew that Roman had arrived in the room and called him accordingly. They realized that when Roman received the call, Hilbert was not in the room, he had stepped out. Just then, Galois' gaze lands on Hilbert's purse with EC written on it, and upon seeing this, he recalls the name the post office guy mentioned, which was a friend Quavis. Pascal immediately checks Hilbert's bag and finds a phone with a call history that includes a call to Roman. The truth dawns on them. Hilbert is caught, and a sinister smile crosses his face. Pascal dials Roman's number on the phone, but Hilbert calmly tells them that Roman must have already died by now. Hilbert reveals that he had sprayed poison under the seat belt in Roman's car, and as soon as Roman put on the seat belt he must have immediately died without leaving any traces of murder. However in reality, Roman is still alive and on his way to the gathering because he hasn't put on the seat belt until now. However, he gets pulled over by the police for speeding, and the police ride in his car to his home because Roman has forgotten his license at home. The officer asks him to put on the seat belt and as soon as Roman does so, the poison is released, and the car falls from the cliff killing both Roman and the cop. Meanwhile, Hilbert reveals that he spent 35 years of his life trying to prove the gold box conjecture, and he was about to present it to the world in 10 days after some final verifications. However on that very day, a news broke that a 20-year-old has successfully proved gold box conjecture, rendering all of Hilbert's years of hard work futile. He was completely devastated and had even contemplated suicide, but before taking such a drastic step, he felt a strong curiosity to meet Galois. But the very next day, another news emerged that someone had destroyed Galois' demonstration of gold box conjecture. Learning this he sent an email to Galois, seeking to meet him, but it was Oliva, Galois' girlfriend, who replied, confirming that Galois' demonstration had indeed been destroyed, and this is how he truly met Oliva. This revelation shocks Galois again because it means the entire story Oliva has just narrated about chess and the yacht was a made-up tale. Hilbert says that even if he had presented his gold box conjecture demonstration to the media after 10 days, in the eyes of the world, Galois would still be the first person to have successfully proven it. In frustration, Hilbert asks Galois how at just the age of 20, he managed to achieve what took Hilbert 35 years, but Galois stays silent. Hilbert reveals that he set up this room to put Galois' intelligence to the test, determining if he is truly capable of solving the gold box conjecture. Pascal asks Hilbert, but why he wants to kill Roman and him. 
Hilbert replies that after everyone's death when the police investigate, they would conclude that Roman had killed Pascal as revenge for his daughter, and the others who died here would be considered collateral victims of Roman's rage, making them Roman's circumstantial victims. Hilbert doesn't care if he dies with them too, he just wants the credit of being the first person to prove Goldbach's conjecture. That's why he has also brought the proof of Goldbach's conjecture with him. His plan is that if Galois is dead, no one will be able to rework the proof. When the police find the demonstration, Hilbert will be credited as the first person to prove the gold box conjecture, securing his place in history. However Galois drops a bombshell. He reveals that he never actually proved the gold box conjecture, it was all a lie he concocted to gain all of his attention. As the lie spiraled out of control, it spread worldwide, and the media began clamoring for his demonstration. Galois was in over his head, not knowing what to do, so he decided to destroy his own house, just to buy himself some time. With that, Hilbert realizes he is the one and only one in this world who has resolved the Goldbach conjecture. However, in a fit of anger, Galois punches Hilbert, causing him to lose consciousness. Pascal scolds Galois for his actions since Hilbert was the only one who might have helped them get out of this room. By this point, the room has shrunk so much that the ceiling fans are now scraping against the walls. Pascal then reveals that the mathematician David Hilbert died at the age of 81, and the present Hilbert's age is less than 81, which means that Hilbert had a plan to get out of the room. He further mentions that Hilbert created this trap to test Galois' intelligence, which implies that there should be some way out. They notice the word freedom written on the blackboard, which was used to explain the freedom door enigma. The three of them start breaking the blackboard, and behind it, they find an elevator. One by one, they start escaping through the elevator. However Galois takes Hilbert's demonstration with him before leaving. They all safely make their way out and look at the place where they were stuck for hours, just at the brink of death. Then they sail back on the boat, and Galois is torn by confusion wondering whether he should publish the demonstration of Goldbach's conjecture under his name, which would be unethical since Hilbert had actually solved it. However, if he were to publish it, he could gain significant fame and recognition. Pascal picks up the demonstration and throws it into the river, saying, confusion solved. Galois gets angry, asking how he could do this when humanity has been trying to solve it for 250 years. Pascal simply responds, the world remains as it was. Oliva smiles at this, and with this scene, the movie comes to an end. Subscribing to the channel will make my day better. See you in the next video, till then take care and goodbye.